the idea that certain European Stone Age cultures feature incorporated pottery may be viewed as an archaeological parallel to the history of early Indo-European languages and all one. But I am strong to judge from recent literature as well as several web websites. Concerning Northern Europe, it is the third millennium BC Danish Silurian culture and the uh, quite similar Swedish Norwegian Battleaxe culture, which are mentioned most often, while the earlier fourth millennium uh, Trelawica culture is mentioned more in the passing or as a possible early predecessor. Quarry decorated pottery is met with in both or all of these, and it was a problem for tw early 20th century Scandinavian archaeology that it was so difficult to see any clear connection between early and later core decorated pottery. It is possible that this may now be viewed differently in light of recent archaeological finds and studies concerning particularly the, the coast of South Norway. And this may lead to a discussion about the nature of the introduction of Indo-European culture to this part of Europe. For an archaeologist such as myself, it is of course important to remember at all times that the concept of Indo-European is a linguistic one. The idea of Proto-Indo-European as the historical root of languages from Icelandic to Sanskrit and from Portuguese to Tocari concerns history of language. It is all the more important to remember this precisely and just because the idea continues to trigger the imagination also of historians and archaeologists. Archaeologists need to be continuously reminded that as there is nothing intrinsically or obviously Indo-European about archaeological material, it is necessary to reflect on the method involved in arguing for historical connections between linguistics and archaeology. I hope on this occasion to provide an example of an archaeological nature from prehistory which may give some food for thought also for those primarily concerned with Indo-European language in particular concerning Northern Europe. As prehistorians, we must be prepared to leave behind the comparatively safe waters of the occasions when texts of one kind or another in some Indo-European language are found directly or in connection with archaeological remains. One method for expanding the concept of Indo-European into other fields of study is to look for analogies in the archaeological or historical trajectory to the events implied by language history. The homeland question is, of course, the classical example of this procedure. The question, if there is anything in archaeology to set beside the idea of a pre-proto-Indo-European language in time, space and culture has challenged, challenged archaeologists for several generations of scholars. Similar questions may be asked, and indeed have often been asked, concerning the separation of Greek or Celtic or Germanic or Tocharian or any of the branches of Indo-European language. Perhaps it might also occasionally be possible to turn the priorities around, to ask whether significant events and conditions in the historical or archaeological record can give occasion for reflection also about features of linguistic history. One such question may concern the possibility that the introduction of Indo-European culture to any one region such, such as Northern Europe may have been a protected process involving several episodes, events and phases. In archaeology, the introduction of Indo-European language and culture to Northwestern Europe and Scandinavia tra traditionally has been attributed to the Cordenware cultural horizon about 2800 BC in its various local guises as the single grave culture in Denmark, in, particularly in Jutland, or the Botex or Batlex culture in Finland, Sweden, and Norway, but also to the late Nordic late Neolithic culture from 2400 BC, in recent literature often associated with the Bell Beaker and Beaker cultures. Now, leaving aside for the moment the never-ending debate on the appropriateness, appropriateness or otherwise of the concept of archaeological cultures, it is relevant to look for elements of these archaeological cultures that may provide a link with a possible area of origin of Indo-European language. This fabled if hypothetical realm, of course, has been placed variously on the map of Europe and Asia. For the present occasion, I shall accept the majority view that the most likely candidate is the steps of the present-day Ukraine, or somewhere thereabouts. 
There are several elements of material culture, which in one sense is what archaeology basically is about, that are common to the various northern Neolithic cultures just mentioned, and at the same time characteristic enough to provide possible links with the neighboring world in Europe and Asia. There are certain features of weaponry to consider, in particular the oft-mentioned battle axe of stone, which in some forms or other are present in all of the northern European, northern New Stone Age cultures. This is the most crater that we have in Norway. Uh, they were largely, largely replaced with flint daggers, of course, as the principal weapon of the Scandinavian late Neolithic. Archery is another field of interest, as is the pressure flaking technique in working flint and other microcrystalline rocks, perhaps also early metallurgy, as well as the manufacturing and use of pottery. One feature that might repay closer investigation is that of pottery ornamentation. All over the world, the shapes and ornamentation of clay pots have caught the interest of archaeologists. The reason for this is obvious. Among the archaeological material available to the student of, in particular, prehistoric societies, there is little to set beside pottery for both variety of expression and shapes and for sheer abundance of material. Throughout the history, there was enormous variation in the way pots were shaped and decorated. It so happens that the, period, the, the prehistoric period which most concerns the Indo-European question, that is the Neolithic and the Emerging Bronze or Copper Age, in Europe is among the most rich in ceramic forms and ornaments. The reasons why people decorate pots need not detain us long here may have to do with particular aesthetic considerations or perhaps such concerns as functional aspects, design, designs concerned with ownership or our identities of makers or, and use, users of pots. It is of relevance to say that pottery ornaments throughout the period in question in Northern Europe always was produced with impressions in the clay pots prior to burning and with very few exceptions was concerned with purely geom geometric patterns and not with anything obviously reminiscent of actual pictorial representations. The general impression remains that pottery decoration appears to have little or no connection with particular functional considerations. It may have had a functional origin perhaps of some sort, but the way it appears it's just an element of decoration, almost by definition a form of communication. In this respect, it's different from battle axes, pressure flaking, and indeed pottery as such, all of which are linked to particular functions or practical considerations. This makes the rules that may appear to have been operating all the more interesting as they must have been governed by purely cultural concerns. One of the most common forms of pottery decoration in the Northern Stone Age consists of impressions of cords and strings which among other things, of course, has been used to give name to the corded work culture or, or horizon. As this is one feature that might seem to link Scandinavia with southeastern Europe, and at just the time of the Neolithic cultures, I shall consider it somewhat more closely. Technically speaking, cord impression ornaments appear to have been produced with several different types of cord. I might mention that cord is the traditional term in archaeology for this, although string or yarn might be formally more correct in terms of textile technology. The simplest type of cord to have been used for pottery decoration is the single two-ply string or cord. Another more complex form consisted of one cord being coiled more or less tightly around another or around any form of cord producing an impression sometimes reminiscent of barbed wire. Another much rarer form of cord impression appears to have been produced with a cord tied into a string of knots. That's an example of that. It is usually difficult to ascertain whether the cords used were made from textile fibers such as flax, bast, or metal, or from wool, even though impressions of individual fibers may be discernible. The cord stamp, which is what I imply by this instrument, 
we argue, arguably recall the most complicated pottery decoration instrument that was in use throughout the Northern Neolithic, consisting as it does of at least two elements, the cord and the cord, whereas all others seem to have been simple, whether in the form of a cord or otherwise. These forms of pottery ornament do not appear at other times in Northern prehistory, such as, for example, the early Iron Age, which was another period of production of richly decorated pottery. In general, it seems preferable to assume that cord impression ornaments, and perhaps in particular the cord stamp, were inven invented only once, and not two, three or more times. The, this assumption also, and in particular, applies to the whole set of cord decoration techniques with single cord, cord stamp, and string of knots. Now, as I have indicated, in North European archaeology, cord impression ornaments are not exclusive to the corded bare horizon but appear in several historical environments at various times and with somewhat di uh, different geographical distributions, all, however, within the confines of the Neolithic or Late Stone Age. The earliest appearances, uh, appearance is in the Eastern, predominantly Finnish, comb ceramics culture, whose early uh, sparing swan stage cord stamp ornaments were in use as early as uh, 5,100 to 4,500 BC, however, not later. The relation of this to later events farther west, west, west in Northern Europe is a subject in need of attention, but there is a considerable time gap of several centuries that does not seem easily abridged. In southern and south southwestern Scandinavia, cord and cord stamp ornaments appear in the early Neolithic funnel beaker culture, the, which is abbreviated TRB. The TRB is a vast cultural com complex present from northwestern Ukraine to Poland across the North European lowlands into the low countries and in south Scandinavia, where it forms the historical setting for the first agriculture. In Scandinavia, the TRB occupies the time approximately 3,900 to 2,800 BC. But the use of cord, and in particular cord stamp or decoration, mainly took place within the so-called Biru or Bellevue style in southeast Denmark, where we are now, and in Scania, about 3,600 to 3,200 BC. Farther north, both cord and cord stamp decoration are met with again on a number of mostly coastal hunting and fishing settlement sites along the coast of South Norway and dated to the late 4th and early 3rd millennia BC, certainly lasting several centuries longer than the Vedum period in South Scandinavia and into the next main period. There is an ongoing debate about the nature and most appropriate cultural affiliation of these Norwegian sites, but in my view, it's preferable to consider them as belonging to a cultural entity of their own, one involving great variety through time and space, but at the same time being sufficiently different from South Scandinavian TRB and from the contemporary Southeastern Scandinavian Pittenberg culture that warrant the name of its own. I have suggested that it might be called the court stamp culture in keeping with the tradition of such name giving in archaeology. Above all, it is the rich material excavated at a settlement site called Aube in Sandefjord Westfold on the western shore of the Oslo Fjord, which has been important for this argument. The Aube site was a coastal hunting site. Here is a spine of porpoise to indicate what they were doing there. Then there is was lots of pottery, often found like this, as jigsaw pestles, more or less. Dates emerge from this diagram. And pottery, some of it looked like this. Then, <coughs> cord and cord stamp ornaments are present on pottery in the Swedish Norwegian battle axe culture. Uh, this is also from Aube, by the way. This is this too, and this. And here we are with the battle axe culture, part of the large corded culture complex, of course. It 
is present, as, it, as its name implies, in Sweden and Norway, but mostly in Scania and Middle Sweden, at least concerning the pottery. It is dated to 2800 to 2400 BC. Cord stamp ornaments, in particular, appear to the comparatively late northern F style of cultural pottery, to keep in with the terminology of what's been ordered. This is a map of F culture, F style pottery. I have argued elsewhere that these occurrences of cord stamp ornaments in Scandinavia, excepting the early stages of the court of the common ceramics culture in Finland, but including the TRB, the cord stamp culture as I call it, and this battle axe pottery, form an historical sequence, and that the three stages outlined uh, were historically connected to form one continuous tradition. This would, in seem, would seem to solve an old problem in Scandinavian archaeology, one that occupied the minds of scholars from Sufis Miller to Matske Malmir, namely that there did not seem to be any link between the cord stamp ornaments in the TRB, the Vidum style, and that found in the battle axe culture, the F, but also the G and H styles. The missing link, I suggest, is provided by the cord stamp culture, fitting typologically, as well as regarding geography and chronology. It was just this old chestnut that bothered the Danish archaeologist and conservator Gustav Rosenberg, and which in 1928 induced him to set out on a journey to archaeological museums in Central and Eastern Europe to look for the origin of the perceived dichotomy in the Danish Neolithic between the cord decorated pottery found inside the communal megalithic graves of the Fanobiker culture and that found in the single graves of the Jutish single grave culture. At Rosenberg's time and for a long time after, these two cultures were cultures were believed to be contemporaneous in Denmark. And it was only with stratigraphical finds and accurate radiocarbon dates appearing in the mid-1970s that it became clear that they were in fact consecutive. Rosenberg came as far as Odessa and Kiev and was shown the then recent finds from the Usatova Cemetery in the Ukraine. Among the Usatova pottery, he found thousands of shards with cord as well as cord stamp ornaments. Two motifs which occur time and again on pottery from the Ukraine to Scandinavia are very frequent on the Ustova pottery. The short arcs of cord stamp impressions forming rows just underneath the rim of the vessels, so called caterpillar motif, and the singular double line of cord stamp around the neck of the vessels. He goes on to follow the cord and cord stamp pottery ornaments toward the north eventually into the Kamp ceramics culture in Finland and to the north northwest via the certain more or less accidental finds south of the Baltic and in North Poland to the Van Beeker culture and later cultures of Neolithic Scandinavia. And he finishes with a short survey of similar pottery from the British Isles. Uh, Rosenberg's obs observations, which he published in a book called uh, Strömungen in Europa zu Steinzeit. They made considerable impression in Western Europe, and his conclusions were well received by Graham Clark, among others, and for quite some time rep represented almost the only work of reference for these matters in West, Arche West European archaeology. Now, the point here is not to follow the court stamp in detail in all its variations of motives and through all the cultural environments in which it appears across Eastern and Northern Europe, but to point to the obvious parallel between the distribution of this particular artistic tradition and the spread of Indo-European language toward Northern Europe. I'm certainly not an expert on Ukrainian archaeology, but the finds of Usatova in more recent studies seem to be considered to represent a stage of influences from earlier core decorated cultures of the Ukrainian steppe upon the Neolithic Tripoli tradition of the Eastern Balkan and its painted pottery. The tradition of decorating pots with cord and cord stamp impressions had earlier representation in the Yamnaya and Sredny Stog cultures in the Ukraine, dating back to the perhaps 5th millennium BC. And according to the late Ukrainian archaeologist Dmitry Tilyegin, it occurs first in the second stage of the famous Dereivka site. 
from the Sudanese dog, the practice spread in various directions, including the Usatova stage in the west, where it is frequent, as well as to the Balkan and to the northwest, into Poland and to northern Europe. In the latter case, initially, in a more sporadic fashion in the TRB and subsequent globular amphora culture, and perhaps not as part of a more comprehensive package, including burial rites, the use of horses, and so on, such as had been the case farther south. David Anthony has put forward the attractive hypothesis that it was precisely the Osotoba culture which was the origin and the of the spread of Indo-European culture to the Northwest, eventually evolving into the Germanic branch of the Indo-European language family and connected with the late TRB in Poland and then with the Cordoberg culture. But also in archaeology, styles of battle axes as well as of pottery everywhere to, appears to have local roots as well as uh, general similarities across the entire Cordoberg horizon. However, as I have indicated, cord and cord stamp decorated pottery appeared earlier than this in Scandinavia, both in the Comceramisk culture in the east and in the TRB in the west. Short of assuming that this mode of pottery decoration was invented independently in several places, might this not be a sign of Indo-European influences in the northwest of one kind or another several centuries earlier than the corded bear phenomenon. In the event, we must reckon with the with events that took place as early as approximately 3600 BC, according to radiocarbon dates of the Vedum style. It may be that at this early stage, we should follow to in, in that the influence did not yet have the form of a package, such as may have been the case regarding the corded bear. The obvious similarities in the form of burial customs, weaponry, etc., even if partly present, are not of the same order as they were to become later, and it may be that one should look for some form of more limited contact to account for them. A possible clue as to what this may have been is the commonly attested circumstance that pottery in early societies often was a part of women's sphere of life. Now, if women migrated toward Northwest earlier than the prestige induced spread at the time of the late TRB and the Cordenware culture, perhaps in connection with marriage relations. This might account for the presence of the early cord and cord stamp decorated pottery of the Vedum and related styles, and similarly for the restricted character of this influence. This might be the backdrop to the development of distinct local styles of pottery decoration in the TRB as well as in the cord stamp culture prior to the arrival of the corded ware package around 2800. A consequence of this short survey is that the connection between the linguistic theory about the origin and spread of the, of the Indo-European languages and archaeology, and in particular the archaeology of Neolithic Northwestern Europe, may not be quite as straightforward as has sometimes been supposed. It certainly seems likely that the introduction and establishment of Indo-European language, Proto-Germanic, if you will, in the north happened during the New Stone Age, third and fourth millennia BC, but it may have been a long drawn process and one characterized by considerable dynamism. The three main phases of Neolithization of Scandinavia may correspond to three phases of introduction of new cultural elements, including language. This may have amounted to a thorough rubbing in of the Indo European language and a similar Similarly thorough wiping out of earlier languages. It seems relevant then to ask the linguists if there is any trace of several such phases in the language record. May this be the reason, or part of the reason, why there apparently are so few, or indeed no traces in South and Middle Scandinavia, of the languages that were spoken before Germanic was introduced, something which is otherwise quite common in most of Europe, for example, as place names. In Denmark, South Sweden, and South Norway, there are, to my knowledge, indeed no place names that might be thought of as, as predating Indo European. The names that do exist of another likely origin are certainly much later, whether concerning Slavic names in the southern Danish islands or Sami names in Sweden and Norway. 
is a group of certainly very old and prominent names of farms and parishes in, in southwest Norway that are of quite opaque etymology, but even those have been shown in recent studies to most likely be of Germanic origin. The most well known among them is Sugra, the airport of Stavanger. Right. Thank you. conservator, as I said, uh -huh. and he was responsible, among other things, for, for taking care of the yacht stream boat. Uh -huh. And then he made this trip to Eastern Europe and came back and, and published this book and then visited Sofus Miller and proudly showed him the book. And uh, Sofus Miller was not too impressed. Oh, my dear Rosenberg, he said, you want to be an archaeologist also now. But the book is not, it's real, worth a read, yeah, and it's not a big book. Um, as a researcher of place names myself, I would just like to uh, point out that there indeed are um, place names in the Rogaland area that indeed has very unclear etymology. Oh, yes. Um, uh, so, I, I mean, the, Examples like Sula, where it has been close uh, with Germanic origins, there are still, uh, still cases of place names that are unsolved. Absolutely. Yeah. But uh, I was thinking about Sula in particular because uh, a Norwegian scholar, Harald Nuevan, fairly recently has written an article where he finds the origin of Sula to be a Germanic mm -hmm. one. There are also uh, Years ago, well, maybe not a couple of years ago, but at uh, Tasta, one of the places, uh, place names uh, with unclear etymology, there have also uh, been findings of um, farm houses uh, that predate the uh, battle axe culture. Oh, yeah. Mm. Mm. Right. 
Thank you very much.